Oh, do you want to kick it off, Liz? Sure. Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for attending today. Um, it's obviously, we know it's an hour out of your, out of your day, but uh, we really hope that you'll, you'll get something good out of it today. And thanks also to the VFCA volunteers, especially James, who helped organise this, this event. I uh, really appreciate that. Firstly, I'm going to welcome, um, and uh, in the spirit of reconci reconciliation, just acknowledge the traditional custodians of country um, throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay, pay our respect to uh, their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. We acknowledge that sovereign, sovereignty was never ceded. So my name is Liz, I'm a VET volunteer here at Vets for Climate Action, and I um, just wanted to say, you know, it's been a year since the fires tore through much of Australia, and I was so upset by the fires watching the app multiple times every day, and, and yet I wasn't even on the front line, and, and I know that a lot of you were, and we can only really imagine the pain and suffering that you saw watching the animals we love so dearly. The scale of the disaster was truly humbling and quite scary for, for the future. And with the Royal Commission um, announcing that the fires were linked to climate change, we at VFCA felt that it was time that the voices of both vets, carers and staff workers on the front line <coughs> was heard. So it's one year since that since that time. And I guess it's easy for the public and the politicians to forget, but I don't think that we will ever forget given some of the images that uh, some of us have seen uh, around those fires. Uh, later on in today, after the after the talks by Leslie and Mark, I'll, I'll uh, just give you a little bit of an update about the vigil for animals that we have planned. Um, but the first step really is to uh, get you all a better understanding of where we're at with climate change, especially in Australia, and also how it, it affects the animals that we love in particular. Just a bit of housekeeping regarding the webinar. Um, if you can post any questions you have in the chat, that would be fantastic. And we'll ask them at the end of the session. Uh, Leslie and Mark have been pretty gracious in the past and usually have stayed online if, if you want to have a chat afterwards or ask other questions. Uh, that's that seems to be um, something they've been good at doing. So yeah, happy for you to do that at the end. If we missed your question or you had to get off uh, in the meantime, just email us at info at vfca.org.au. I think Ben will put that email address up in the chat. Um, so you've got that there. Awesome. So thanks and welcome everybody. Um, today's webinar is in two parts. Firstly, we're going to have Professor Mark Howden from ANU speak and he'll present on the latest climate statistics and policy updates uh, to give us a sort of a broad introduction to the climate crisis. And following that will be Professor Leslie Hughes from Macquarie University who will be outlining the effect in particular on animals and wildlife. So firstly, Mark, um, just a bit of a update or sorry, sorry a bit of a, um, a summary of Mark's uh, experiences. He's a professor and director of the Climate Change Institute at the Australian National University. He's also an honorary professor at Melbourne University, a vice chair of the Intergovernmental Pan Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, and a member of the Australian National Climate Science Advisory Committee. Mark has over 420 publications of different types and he's helped develop both the national and international greenhouse gas inventories that are a fundamental part of the Paris Agreement and has assessed sustainable ways to reduce emissions. He has been a major contributor to the IPCC since 1991 with roles in the second, third, fourth, fifth and sixth assessment reports. And he was a Nobel Prize winner, at least that's a, sort of the, the big one, in uh, 2007. So um, as you can hear, Mark is probably one of the, uh, you know, the country's leading climate scientists. So we do welcome you, Mark. Um, just over the break, don't know if you've been up to anything or if you've heard any good news, uh, but yeah, maybe you can give us a bit of an intro on that before you start. And we need you unmuted. Newbie, uh, newbie mistake there. Um, uh, I, I must admit that there's not a lot of good news happening <laughs> um, at the moment uh, when it comes to the climate change domain. Um, I, I guess apart from uh, the Biden presidency and the implications that ha that has globally, I think it's uh, be hard to underestimate um, how that's going to propagate out uh, to countries such as Australia. So I'll um I'll just uh, share my um screen and um I always get confused which one this is. So can you see a screen with cows on grass? 
Yeah, we can, Mark. Yep. Okay. So, so I'm just going to do a real quick run through of more the climate science side of things and a little bit about policy and uh, the, to some extent, woeful nature of that in Australia. Um, so, so the, the starting point uh, is greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and in this case, this is the carbon dioxide from fossil fuels in this graph going back to 1990. And uh, so over that 30 years, you can see um, these emissions have grown from roughly 22 billion tonnes a year up to last year, those sitting around 36 uh, billion tonnes. Sorry, Mark. Was Sorry to interrupt. I think we're looking at your screen with all the slides, not the one you're actually presenting. Oh, OK. Don't know how that works, but um, so you didn't see that. Okay. No, we're still at the front page oh. or the very first slide. Okay, I'll, I'll try that one again. And um, um, is, is that, oh, hang on. So we're still seeing, is it, I think you can yeah. just use the slide you've got if you want and just click down through them. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, so, so maybe if I do this and, uh, but it won't be the full slideshow. Is that changed then? Yeah. Okay. Right here. Um, so, so what this graph shows is the uh, carbon dioxide concentrations, as I was just saying. Uh, you can see they've gone up over a long period of time uh, until last year um, when we had about a 6.7% decrease according to the Global Carbon Project. And, and that's by far the biggest decrease we've seen in the historical record uh, in absolute terms. And But it's actually sort of roughly consistent with the sorts of decreases that we'd actually need to see year on year uh, to resolve climate change, to actually put, a, put the brakes on climate change. And, and that is because it's, to deal with climate change, it's not about leveling this off. It's not about you know, keeping greenhouse gas emissions at something like 36 billion tonnes a year. And that's because for each of those tonnes of carbon dioxide that we produce, roughly speaking, half a tonne sits in the atmosphere and half a tonne, a quarter of a tonne will get absorbed by the oceans, a quarter of a tonne will get absorbed by the trees and, and grasses and soils on the land. And so that half a tonne will sit around for about a couple of hundred years, that half a tonne in the atmosphere. And it will build on what was there last year and the year before and year before. And so you get this accumulative effect of carbon dioxide because it's such a long lasting greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. And so the consequence of that means that even if we level off greenhouse gas emissions, we're, our temperatures will keep on going up and up and up. Um, to actually uh, reduce the risk of climate change, we have to take these greenhouse gases down to roughly net zero. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, but these, the consequence of this is that uh, we've actually seen really significant increases in the atmospheric um, carbon dioxide concentration. So if you go back in this graph, which um, should show a little wiggly line on it, um, uh, shows um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over the last 800,000 years. Um, the old dump numbers have come from ice core data, and you can see they go up and they go down according to the, the glaciations and interglacials. That's the, um, the long-term history of the Earth. And, and left to its own devices, carbon dioxide concentrations will bounce around between 180 and 280 parts per million. Uh, as of today, we're at 416 and a half parts per million. So we're grossly outside the natural boundaries um, of carbon dioxide. And if you think about this, the sort of animals that, that we're dealing with and the ecosystems we deal with have actually evolved in this sort of environment this sort of envelope of carbon dioxide and the, the you know, climate change is associated with that. And we're actually traveling further and further outside that envelope. And unfortunately, that will generate what we always talk about, which is global warming. And we've actually known that if we pump greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, we'll warm the earth. We've known that for about 150 years now. And so um, essentially carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse gases act like blankets in the atmosphere. They keep some of the heat in against the earth that otherwise it would escape out to space. So they let the direct sunlight through, but, but a, a blanket to infrared um, radiation that comes out from the earth. So it's not surprising given that we've been pumping out billions of tons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and rising the um, atmospheric concentrations that we're seeing consequent 
increases in temperature. So this uh, graph that I've got here is, is uh, just the most recent um, averaged uh, global temperature graph. And you can see that this year was the equal hottest year um, against uh, 2016, which was e about equally as hot. And, uh, and it's already about 1.24 degrees above the pre-industrial average, the 1850 to 1900 average. And really importantly, if it wasn't for the fact that this year is a La Nina, um, which tends to cool the earth, we would have been well above the 2016 number, which was actually an El Nino, which tends to warm the earth. So, so in the absence of, of those drivers of interannual variability, um, we would have actually been the hottest year on record um, this year. Um, and so things are getting worse. They're going up faster and faster over time. And that have really significant consequences on our business, your business, my business. So if we look at Australia, um, last year was the fourth hottest year on record. Um, we can see that black line that goes through this. Um, it, it keeps on going up pretty steadily. So those sorts of variations that we see due to El Nino and La Nina, um, uh, just a bit of noise around that long-term increase. Um, and even though, um, as I mentioned, we've got a La Nina and we tend to be cooler and wetter and greener this year, is that we're still getting fires and really bad fires in parts of the country over in WA, just uh, we've seen that recently. And of course, there's the black summer fires, which caused such damage uh, to people and to the environment and to animals uh, last year. And uh, Elizabeth's already referred to those. If we, we look at what it means in terms of temperature extremes, so those hot extremes where, where we and other animals suffer, um, what we're seeing is those extremes occurring almost everywhere, almost all the time now in Australia. And so this is a, a graph straight from the Bureau of Met's website, which shows the proportion of area of Australia that would, is experiencing in any given year, um, what would have used to have been thought of as an extremely hot year. And you can see in recent years, you know, there's 60s, 70s and 80s and 90% of Australia is affected by what would have been thought of in the past as an extremely hot year. So there is no place to go. You can't actually go pretty much anywhere in Australia and not experience this in most years. And of course, that also relates to things like um, rainfall and droughts and things like that. And particularly across the southern Australia, we've seen reductions in rainfall, uh, particularly um, cool season rainfall, which is what supplies the soil moisture and the the water for our dams and rivers. Uh, and we've seen quite strong trends there, particularly increased droughts and decreases in river flows in both the southeast and southwest corners. Uh, we've seen that fire frequency um, or fire season has extended, the frequency has increased, the burnt area has increased, and the intensity of fires has increased. And that's increased in some ways far beyond what we would have ever expected from the models which were predicting these things, the climate models which have fires built into them. And at the same time um, as we're seeing that sort of risk factor increasing, we're seeing the ability to control those fires decrease um, because the window between the fire season starting and the fire season ending is actually shrinking. And so we're seeing less ability to control and higher risk. We're also seeing in parts of Australia increased tropical cyclones. Uh, so this, these are actually global pictures, but um, we're seeing more tropical cyclones across the globe and more of those that happen are category three, four and five cyclones. And the panel on the right indicates the, the sort of relative increase in cyclones of particular wind speeds. And what we're seeing is the greatest increase in proportionate um, wind speeds is those of the category fives. So, so it's the worst possible scenario, which is actually the worst cyclones are the ones that are increasing fastest. And they're also spreading further towards the poles. So places that, that used to have cyclones, tropical cyclones are now getting affected. And you might say, okay, well, why do I include this in the talk to veterinarians? Well, it was only a year ago um, that we had a combination of the drought in northern Queensland, followed by an incredibly wet period, which is also a cold period, and around about half a million beef cattle died because of that. So they didn't have enough feed to actually maintain their body metabolism. Um, it was a cold uh, and wet sort of environment. They were just losing energy and they died, and they died in the hundreds of thousands. 
So that's why um, I mentioned cyclones. So cyclones are a key part of disruption which affect animals across Australia. Now the question is, um, what, what's going to happen in the future? So, so this is a, a graph which builds on the, the previous um, carbon dioxide concentration graph that I showed you. And, uh, and so that, that's the black line on the left, but also has trajectories of greenhouse gas emissions out into the future. So they range from the, the red one at the top um, down to the blue one, a uh, low emissions feature at the bottom and the dotted line, which is uh, a, you know, one that wasn't actually part of the scenarios. So it's only the blue line and the dashed line, which are actually consistent with the Paris Agreement temperature goals. So the Paris Agreement, we hear lots about the Paris Agreement and net zero and stuff. Net zero is actually not the goal. Net zero is merely a means towards that temperature goal which itself is only a means towards the goal of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is to uh, avoid dangerous human interference with the climate system. And so if we actually think about it, the sort of trajectory we're on, which is pretty much the red trajectory um, versus where we need to go, which is the blue and the dashed line trajectory is massive. We need to decarbonize, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions incredibly quickly um, and almost completely over the next decades. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about just how challenging this will be in a, in a few minutes. So what happens if we don't um, do this? Well, it's not a good picture for um, Australia and I'll actually flip forward um, a few slides uh, because Australia will become much less pleasant place for um, us and much less pleasant place for animals all around the place. Um, a few slides just on heat stress and other factors. So if we look at the top left panel, this is work that I did last century, 1999. Um, the top left panel is the current frequency of heat stress days across Australia. So that is historical numbers. So up at the top end, we all know it's a hot and sweaty environment. You get heat stress pretty quickly if you go outside, but something like 70% of days are heat stress days in the top end. Um, but under scenarios of the future, those sorts of conditions spread over about two thirds of Australia or worse. So in that scenario of about 2.7 degrees Celsius, which is sort of where we're heading if everyone does what they say they do under the Paris Agreement, um, then pretty much every day becomes a heat stress day across the top third of Australia. And those sorts of conditions that used to be experienced in places like central Queensland uh, would now be experienced by Canberra, Melbourne, Sydney, etc. So um, a really different environment in terms of heat stress. Um, if we look at heat waves, um, which are another part of that picture of heat in animals, uh, this is a very recent study um, which looked at the frequency of uh, heat waves and the duration of those heat waves. And what this graph shows is in the green down here, um, that's a 1.5 degree scenario. We, we can see well, it doesn't show, but there's a significant increase in duration and frequency of heat stress days compared with history. Once we go to a two degree scenario, which is the upper level of the Paris Agreement, we get a significant almost doubling of both of those factors. By the time we go to three degrees, which is sort of where we're roughly heading at the moment um, on our trajectory, we end up with a challenging environment for most of Australia. This particular study was Queensland, but in that study, you sort of got your average heat wave duration is something like 15 days. You're getting about six or seven of those a year. So that means 100 days a year are going to be heat waves. I mean, this is no longer, you know, if that's the case, uh, it makes you question what our definition of heat wave is, because that would become pretty much the norm under those circumstances. So if we look at things like runoff, um, so that's the water that feeds our dams, our rivers, provides um, water for our animals um, to drink, is that the picture for Australia is pretty grim. Um, if we look at all but the Northwest, um, the scenario of the future, which matches most closely what's already happening, is this one coming out of the IPCC. And this is changes in runoff. That's the water that feeds our rivers and feeds our dams per degree Celsius. So if we go to a three degrees Celsius um, uh, scenario, which as I said, is where we're heading um, uh, emissions wise, then the Murray-Darling Basin loses something like a half to two thirds of its water. If we go across to um, Southwest WA, they lose about 90% of their water. 
And you might think that's extreme. The only problem is that over in Southwest WA, they've already lost about 85% of their runoff at 1.2 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial. So in some respects, this may actually be an underestimate rather than an overestimate. So we're looking at a much, much drier Australia um, in many years, but at the same time as those extreme wet years are probably going to keep on getting wet and wetter over time. So that sort of strange thing where on average we get drier, but the extreme wet years could actually get wetter. And likewise, in terms of drought, this is a recent study from Australia, and without going into the detail, but basically it says that whether you're looking at sort of, in a sense, normal droughts or extreme droughts, or looking at the frequency or the duration of droughts across every region in Australia, they get worse. And so those sorts of conditions which seriously stress uh, our animals, which cause mass mortality of a lot of animals um, through drought conditions, um, mass uh, fish kills, etc., um, are only like to get worse. So, um, so I'll just flip back to the carbon dioxide budget side of things and the policy. And one of the ways we, we can look at um, sort of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions is what we call a carbon dioxide budget. So what happens is that as carbon dioxide accumulates in the atmosphere, we see a essentially a very linear relationship between that accumulation of carbon dioxide and global temperature. <clears throat> so the more carbon dioxide we have accumulating, um, the higher the temperature gets. And it's almost a straight line relationship. And so that means we can say, okay, well, if we want to say a 1.5 degrees goal to not exceed 1.5, it tells us how much carbon dioxide we can emit in total, accumulated, um, and still be consistent with that 1.5 degrees goal. And you can do that even when we allow for things like the locked in warming, um, non-carbon dioxide gases like methane and nitrous oxide, and feedback from things like permafrost and um, uh, fires, which generate a lot of greenhouse gases. And what it turns out is that for about a 50% chance of staying within the 1.5 degrees temperature range, um, we've only got around about 390 gigatons of carbon dioxide left to emit. And if we think about it, we're actually emitting around about 42 gigatons per year at the current rate. And so if we go at the current rate, we've only got about seven and a half years of greenhouse gas emissions at the current rate before we would have to either go to net zero or simply accept that we're going to exceed 1.5 degrees with all of the negative consequences of that. And so there's a couple of um, things there that are really important. And one is that this concept of net zero that we hear, hear a lot of politicians talking about is not fixed. It's actually determined the time of net zero is actually, if you, if you want to get to any particular temperature goal, is actually determined by what you do right now and over the next few years. So if we keep on going as we are, the time for net zero comes forward tremendously, like to 2030. If we instead um, have strong interim targets, so we start to reduce our emissions quickly now, and so we've got very much lower emissions in 2030 and 2040, we push that net zero date out. So there's a really simple diagram which shows this. Um, this is actually a couple of years old, but it's still a good one, which basically is if we keep on going as we are, then to stay within 1.5 degrees, we essentially fall off a cliff. We have to decarbonize massively, like just within a few years. We have to go from an incredibly emissions intensive world to a very, very low emissions world. Instead, if we start taking fast action and good action, we end up, instead of going over the cliff, we end up in a long, slow glide path, which lands somewhat more gently around about 2040 or 2050 for net zero. And unfortunately, at the moment, particularly in Australia, we're in the over the cliff scenario. We're not the long, slow, peaceful glide path. And so it's really just important when you hear um, politicians and they talk about um, ah, uh, um, ah, uh, preferably 2050. Well, that's actually not the goal. The temperatures are the goals and avoiding dangerous impacts on climate change is the goal. 2050 should be part of a package and that package has to include the net zero time and also the interim targets, what we're going to do by 2030 and what we're going to do by 2040. 
and we need to get on that long slow glide path very quickly and at the moment we're not every indication is that following covid we're going to bounce back to where we were and emissions will go back pretty much to what they were in 2019 and i think it's really in important so as i say in the slide it's about setting a firm net zero time target you know like 2045 or whatever and matching interim targets and having a policy or sets of policies to achieve that and we're really absent the set of policies at the moment and this is not a vanity project for australia this is not about chest beating for politicians and saying i'm better than yours this is about crucially avoiding a future which is really problematic for all of us humans, animals, our environment, our economy, our social networks, etc. And it's becoming increasingly clear because of those impacts that Leslie is going to talk about in a minute, that action in terms of reducing emissions and adapting to the change we're already seeing is much, much less costly than inaction, just going as we are and accumulating those greenhouse gas emissions year after year. So I'll just leave it there. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, yeah, some pretty telling graphs in that in that bunch of graphs. Um, if anyone wants to review those later, we are recording this session, so you can uh, click on the link and have a look at those again later in, in more detail if you wish to. Um, sorry to push along, but we will move on to Leslie, and you can, as I said, ask questions at the end. Um, we'll put them in the chat, and we should be able to get to those without too much trouble. So yeah, thanks very much, Mark. It's always great to have your later slides and I could see that there were some, some new ones there updated, um, which were, were very recent, so thank you. So now we turn to uh, Professor Leslie Hughes. Um, so Leslie is a distinguished, pro distinguished professor of biology and pro vice chancellor of research integrity and development at Macquarie University. She's an ecologist whose main research interest has been the impacts of climate change on species and ecosystems and the implications of climate change for conservation. She is a former lead author in the IPCC's fourth and fifth assessment report, a former federal climate commissioner, and now a counsellor with the Climate Council of Australia. She's also a director of WWF Australia and a member of the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists. So with those credentials, Leslie, we'll hand over. Did you have any good news over the holidays? So you haven't had any yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, like Mark, I think the Biden election was the best news that any of us could have had. And we're already seeing in Australia some of the impacts of, of the pressure being exerted by that new administration on our climate policy. Hence, as Mark says, all the chest beating about net zero, but uh, we're moving. So that's good. Um, thanks, Liz, and thanks, Mark, for that excellent introduction to the topic. So I'm also going to share my screen. Hopefully you can see a full screen. Let me know if you can't. Um, yeah, so I'm mainly wearing my Climate Council hat on today. All right, I'm going to very briefly talk about the impacts of the sorts of trends that Mark's been talking about on wildlife, livestock and pets. Of course, I'm very aware that I'm talking mostly to a bunch of vets and other wildlife and, and animal carers who, who all know a lot more about animal care than, than I do. So uh, my apologies in advance if I tell you some things that uh, you already know. So let me start off with wildlife and I want to put this in the context of the transformation of our ecosystems that we are seeing all around us. So here's just some of those transformations. We are seeing uh, bleaching on coral reefs. We've had three major bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef in the last five years and we have already lost 50% of the hard coral on the reef in the last five years as a result. We are seeing important ecosystems like mangroves also dying during those underwater heat waves that cause bleaching. And mangroves, of course, are enormously important nursery areas for marine life. On land, we are seeing uh, the sorts of declines of rainfall that Mark just mentioned, having impacts on things like the iconic river red gums uh, in the Murray-Darling Basin, affected both by drought and increased salinity. 
few years ago, we saw massive fish mortalities, millions of fish killed in the Menindee Lakes as a result of drought, uh, high temperatures and over allocation of water to irrigation. With sea level rise, we are seeing salt water intruding up rivers into freshwater ecosystems and killing off the sorts of uh, stunning um, freshwater swamps uh, such as we see in places like Kakadu National Park. We are also seeing fires penetrate into ecosystems that are likely never to have seen fire before. Um, this is a picture from 2016 of pencil pines in the uh, Tasmanian World Heritage areas being killed off. These pines are over a thousand years old and they do not survive fire. Then of course there were the Black Summer fires as well, which, which burnt 80% of the Blue Mountains World Heritage Area and 50% of our Gondwanan rainforests. Once again, those rainforests are not fire adapted. They're likely never to have burnt at least for the last few thousand years. Um, even really tough forests like eucalypt forests, jarrah forests here in WA um, have been dying back um, during the extended drought that we've had with a combination of drought and heat waves. And now for the wildlife. So just as an example, here are three pictures of species that we would like to see like this, healthy and happy. Here are three species, uh, pictures of those species in situations that we really don't want to see. So the wheelbarrow is full of spectacle flying foxes that in November 2018 in Cairns, there was a single really hot day over 40 degrees. 23,000 of these flying foxes, which is a endangered species died on that single day which constituted one third of the entire population of that species, mainly young flying foxes and lactating females, which were the most vulnerable. Uh, the bottom picture is of the endangered Carnaby's cockatoo from Western Australia, also very vulnerable to heat. Um, these deaths in particular occurred with a single 42 degree day uh, back in January 2010 hundreds of those cockatoos uh, dropped dead. And the top right hand picture is of a, a relatively common species, of course, the common ringtail, collected by WIRES volunteers down in the Mornington Peninsula in March 2019, um, after a four day heat wave on the back of an extended drought. And it's thought that these possums basically were so desperate to drink that they came down and started to drink seawater and of course died on the beach. And there were over 200 of them collected on a single beach. Now, as I mentioned before, and Liz mentioned at the beginning, we are seeing increased danger of forest fires. This map, for example, shows the change in the forest fire danger index between, um, uh, I can't see it actually because of my, my name is in front of it, but up to 2017. So those dark uh, brownie areas are where the um, FFDI has been increasing the most. And this is before Black Summer. But you can see in particular um, that the southwest corner, the southwest uh, quarter really of the continent is suffering um, extreme increases in risk of fires. And of course, in the black summer, we saw images like this. Uh, somewhere between 18 and probably 25 million hectares in Australia were burnt. Um, 18 million hectares, by the way, is about three times the size of Tasmania. And about 20% of our broadleaf and mixed eucalypt forest were burnt during that single summer. Um, it's been estimated that about 3 billion, that's billion, not million, vertebrates, mammals, birds and reptiles were killed during those fires, uh, with deaths from smoke inhalation being recorded at distances up to 50 kilometres from the fire front. Um, many threatened species also lost most or all of their habitat. Uh, these are just some of those species. <laughs> 
If we look at the iconic koala in particular that's been in the news a lot lately, up to 10,000 koalas died in New South Wales alone, which is about a third of the New South Wales population. 25,000 died on Kangaroo Island, which was half of the population there. A lot more died post-fire um, due to lack of food and shelter. Uh, quite a lot of koalas were brought into hospitals and rehabilitation centres, and I'm sure there's people on this uh, webinar that were involved in that. Uh, but of course, any handling and transport and housing of wild animals like these also uh, increases their level of stress. And many of those animals brought in uh, did not subsequently survive. Um, moving offshore a little bit now, and it was Liz actually that brought my attention to this particular example, which is a great example of a sort of an unexpected wildlife impact. Um, this is the new, newly described syndrome called freshwater skin disease. It's affecting dolphins in particular globally. Uh, the disease onset is always preceded by some sort of extreme event, a strong storm and heavy rainfall that suddenly increases the level of fresh water into a salty body like an estuary or a, an ocean, um, ocean open lake. It um, massively disrupts the electrolyte balance in the animal's bloodstream, uh, which can ultimately lead to organ failure. Um, and there's also secondary infections due to that weakened immune system that show up as skin lesions um, on, the, on the external um, skin. Uh, this is happening to dolphins in Australia fairly recently. There was some incidences of the endangered burren and bottlenose dolphin from the Gippsland Lakes area. Uh, of which there are only 60 left in Gippsland Lakes and only about 130 in Port Phillip Bay, uh, with six dead dolphins being found in those lakes since last December. And it's been once again put down to some increases in heavy rainfall events uh, in the um, area. And there's 80% uh, of the dolphins in the lakes um, uh, have been recorded as having some sort of skin lesions from this syndrome. So moving on now to livestock and pets, which are lumped together because the issues are really very similar. And we can sort of divide these into three broad categories. There's the extreme events that cause direct mortality in the short term. There are impacts of heat stress and the sorts of heat waves that Mark's been talking about, which cause um, changes to metabolism, oxidative stress, and changes to the immune system. And then there are a lot of indirect impacts which are harder to quantify, such as the quality and quantity of drinking water and food, but also the distribution, transmission, and virulence of pests and pathogens. So let me uh, give you a few examples of these. Mark mentioned this flooding event already, North Queensland, February 2019. Somewhere probably in the order of 500 to 600,000 cattle, head of cattle killed in those floods. It was the worst ever event of that type. Then, of course, as has been previously mentioned, there was a lot of stock lost during the Black Summer bushfires, and there will be people on this call, I'm sure, um, involved in euthanizing injured wildlife. Um, heat stress, of course, is particularly a problem for intensively farmed livestock. So things like chickens and other things that are very fast growing, high yielding stock are most at risk because they tend to also all already have higher internal heat loads. So they're, they're at that real threshold of vulnerability. Um, heat stress affects appetite via hormones like ghrelin, uh, then decreases food intake, which of course can have flow on impacts to weight loss, lethargy and various other sorts of malaise. Ruminants in particular, um, when they suffer from heat stress, can suffer increased risk of lameness, various metabolic disorders, acidosis, respiratory alkalosis and altered energy balance. And indoor farm animals, especially in heat, heat lot, um, feed lots are particularly at risk 
from any failure of ventilation and air conditioning systems. So as an example of this, um, it was just one um, day in a farm in Adelaide where a heat wave um, affected not just uh, everything outside, but a failure of an air conditioning system caused the deaths of 2,000 chickens in, very, in a very short time period on a single farm. Now, nutrition can be affected both positively and negatively due to climate change. It's a complex topic. Um, via effects on pasture growth, uh, the quality of feed, and also the seasonality and variability of the feed. Um, we're seeing decreased pasture growth in some marginal areas, which increases, of course, the risk of hunger and starvation. Um, we're also seeing that higher temperatures can be associated with increased contamination of feedstuffs by fungal toxins like um, endotoxins. Um, for those animals in feedlots that receive supplementary concentrates um, as a compensation for, for low pasture, um, protein digestion rates can be elevated under heat stress, body temperature increased accordingly, um, and leading to, in turn, increasing risk of those heat-related illnesses. So all of these things are connected to each other. In terms of parasites and vector-borne diseases, we are already seeing changes in the distribution of vectors such as mosquitoes, flies, lice, ticks and mites. Uh, particularly those uh, normally um, confined to tropical regions are uh, turning up further and further south in subtropical and what we've previously thought of as temperate regions. This, of course, has real implications for, for pets, things like heartworm, which is spread by mosquitoes, implications for livestock, especially cattle, subject to cattle ticks, which are spreading into more southerly areas. Um, and we're also seeing the direct impacts of temperature on things like fly strike. So some research has pointed out that a three degree increase in temperature is associated with a doubling of incidence of fly strike in lambs and a quadrupling of the risk in ewes. If we just think about pets and particularly in cities, um, we are we know a lot about the urban heat island effect. So cities tend to be hotter, cities and towns tend to be hotter than surrounding areas, both because of internal heat generation and also because of black surfaces like roads absorbing heat. Um, and they can be heat, several degrees hotter on any given day than the surrounding countryside. Um, and what people, a lot of people, I think, especially when they're out walking their dogs, sort of fail to appreciate that air temperature is one thing, but pavement temperature is another. And we, we know that temperatures of, say, 25 degrees ambient air temperature can actually translate into a footpath temperature of over 50 degrees. So think about those little pores getting burned. If we think about the thermal neutral zone of, of different animals, of course, it's different for different animals. You know, dogs, for example, have a thermal neutral zone of about 20 to 30 degrees. Um, guinea pigs, which are smaller, have a, have a lower uh, neutral zone. Um, they can suffer significant heat stress in temperatures as low as 28 degrees. Of course, this vulnerability depends on lots of things, the type of animal, their age, their, their breed, um, their reproductive status, etc. But many of their behaviours can also be affected. Um, foraging for food, their sleep patterns, um, their, their behaviour in terms of how they interact with humans. Animals get uh, cross and potentially violent in uh, hot times, just like people can. During extreme events, it's also the case that pets are also at great risk of being displaced during evacuations, especially when those things are happening very quickly under emergency situations. A lot of evacuation centres actually don't allow pets to be brought. And what this means is that um, people will delay evacuating from fires or floods often because of their concerns about their pets. And it is the case that 
people have died because they have delayed evacuating, especially in, uh, in front of bushfires uh, because of concerns about their pets and livestock. So once again, there are interactions there between human and pet welfare. And just briefly at the end, um, extreme sports also um, can increase the risk uh, during periods of heat waves. So for thoroughbred horses, body temperature increases about one degree per minute of every minute racing. In greyhounds, the increase is even more, um, two degrees uh, increased body temperature in less than a minute of extreme racing. So when these sports are happening on heat wave days, you can very quickly see how the risk to these animals increases. Um, finally, some references. For those of you interested in delving into this, a lot of um, the information I've presented today comes from this really handy RSPCA report published a couple of years ago on, and there's a, a link there that you can go to, and I've put up a couple of other um, links to um, useful references in this area. I want to very quickly finish off by giving the Climate Council a plug because there's an enormous amount of resources on the Climate Council well website. Um, we like to think they're aimed at the intelligent lay reader. There's over 120 reports there on just about everything to do with climate change. Our latest one is called Hitting Home. It's about extreme weather and particularly the economic but also other impacts um, of uh, climate change as a result of policy inaction. Um, vets and other animal carers are trusted people in communities and therefore have a huge role to play in communicating about these sorts of issues. Um, and if you want a bit of guidance about how to have climate change um, conversations, um, we've produced a, a little guide to those conversations also on the Climate Council website. Um, we also have a climate action toolkit um, with a whole bunch of hints as to how you can uh, act um, and also reduce your own personal footprint. So I'll leave it there and uh, thank you very much. Very happy now to try and answer questions. Thanks so much, Leslie. Um, I guess seeing that again, because we had a we had this talk uh, some months ago, but it has changed a little bit. But for me today, I think one of the things that really hits home is just the is the multiple impacts. I mean, I think most of us see one news item or another, and we go, "Oh, that's bad, that's bad." But when you see it as a whole, it really makes so much sense that the whole ecosystems are transforming, as you said in the beginning. Um, and the impacts are just so far reaching on in so many ways, not just you know in bushfires, but on reefs and, and so many different animals. Um, so I think it's important for all of us who work with animals that we that we understand the the problems that, that our animals are going to be facing. Um, and you know, as vets, you know, I certainly became a vet because I love animals. And and 30 years ago, I, I had no idea that climate change would be the biggest threat facing our animals uh, that we that we are going to face now and into the next sort of decade or so. Um, please add any questions that you have into the chat because. Uh, Leslie and Mark would be happy to answer those coming up. Um, the question is always, you know, what can we do? Do we feel helpless? Do we get depressed? And believe me, all of us at VFCA have been through those times. We've, we've spent many years, sometimes even longer, being in a state of, oh my God, what are we going to do sort of thing. Um, but I think as Leslie said, one of the key things about us in, in the profession that we're in is that we are, we are trusted scientists in many ways and trusted professional people. And people do listen, especially when we talk about the frontline issues that, that we've seen. Uh, we're, we're sort of the messengers, if you, the messengers, if you like, about uh, about the impacts on animals. So one of the big things I think is that we talk to other people, that we we reach out to the people who don't necessarily have uh, those visions and haven't seen what we've seen. Um, so there is so much you can do. And I think um, Leslie has outlined some of those in a toolkit uh, from the Climate Council, which is fantastic. Um, just now, before we go to questions, I'd like to just talk briefly about the uh, vigil for animals that we've got coming up. Um, as you know, most of you are aware of this and we've uh, started out um, talking to the zoos and wildlife um, uh, sort of organisations and now it's moved on to RSPCA, WIRES, Animals Australia, which we're so glad to have all of you on board. Um, the, uh, the, the, the 
Vigil is going to be a, um, a physical event, which will be held at Taronga Zoo on the 4th of March on the Thursday, but will also be a, a quite a big social media campaign. And the hashtag for our fauna is what we've chosen to, to launch that campaign. It's really a national moment to pause and grieve the loss of animals killed in the, in the black summer bushfires. And as we know, 3 billion animals is, is just so hard to get your head around. Um, so the, the social media event will probably kick off the end of Feb um, and we want you all to be involved as much as you can. And that means sharing the social media posts and, and images professionally and personally to as many people as you can. Um, the idea is that we want this to go viral and it, if it doesn't this year, then we'll certainly be pushing for that next year uh, if it depends on how we go this year. So um, we'll probably post a link on, on our page um, so that you can see what we've organized in terms of the landing page for the vigil. Um, but yeah, there's going to be lots of different uh, activities going on in, on social media. Um, also, it is a pretty, pretty critical time for uh, animal welfare organizations to have a climate position statement. And I know some organizations already do. Uh, but if you need any help with that, I was just going to just hand over briefly to Morgan from the Climate Media Center before we go to questions, just to talk about how uh, they can help if you do require any help in that regard. Thanks, Morgan. Hi, all. My name is Morgan. I'm one of the campaigners at the Climate Council, so I focus predominantly on extreme weather and working with the emergency leaders for climate action, who are ex-fire chiefs and emergency services uh, professionals who have a lot of experience in this area. So um, I know Leslie has really sung this song pretty well today as one of our experts at the Climate Council, um, one of our councillors, but certainly we like to think of ourselves at Climate Council as not just experts on the science, but on the communications as well. There's a lot to think about with communicating about climate change and um, approaching it in the right way with different audiences and meeting people where they're at. So at any point, if we can be helpful in terms of media training of how best to approach the media in terms of climate communications for your zoo or organization, we do that for free, as well as we can provide briefings to any of your relevant staff on either climate science like you've seen today or on the latest on climate change communications and the message testing that's been done, how do audiences respond to different sorts of statements, what sort of things can you ask a community member to do that they'll be responsive to? We have a lot of data on that that we're happy to share, as well as uh, Liz alluded to any help with documents. So if you're producing in-house messaging documents about how to talk to your audiences or um, developing a climate position statement, we're really help happy to help out with that as well. I'll post my email in the chat and feel free to be in touch at any point if any of that sounds really interesting. Thank you, Morgan. Fantastic support. And Leslie and Mark, we really, really do appreciate the help that you've given us today. Um, ben and James, we've, have we got some questions that we'd like to throw back to our speakers or to anyone really at VFCA or Morgan? Yeah, no worries. So we've got um, two questions that uh, kind of follow quite a similar pattern, which is what can ordinary people do to make an impact in kind of their daily lives? And if Mark or Leslie, if you want to field that one. Yeah, sure. Um, th th thanks, James. And, and thanks, uh, I can't remember who was who asked that one, but um, but uh, um, there's, there's a huge amount we can do. But one of the things that we need to do is just recognize that at the moment, there's this quite subtle, but quite persistent push for the responsibility of climate change down onto individuals. So it's, so it's saying, you know, your diet is wrong or your, you know, plane travel behaviours are wrong or the way you travel to work is wrong or whatever it might be. And, and so, so what that does is it individualises action and, uh, and depending on the person, it may actually get a positive response. People may change or people sometimes feel disempowered and don't engage. I think it's important to recognise that, yes, individual action can be appropriate and, and is often very empowering, um, but really important to push back up into government and into companies, into business community and saying, um, sorry, this isn't good enough. Um, that what you're doing is actually not communicating the facts. It's not responding in the way that we need as a nation. Um, and I'm going to vote with my feet or um, you know, vote with my wallet in terms of my choices. And, uh, and so starting to push back up the system um, and so I think um, we've actually done a, a recent study on this, which 
actually showed that the vast majority of people saw responsibility as both an organisational responsibility and a personal responsibility. So it was shared. It wasn't one or the other. It was a shared responsibility. So I think, I think that's a, um, a, a good start. But it's really also important to recognise that almost everything we do in, in our modern environments uh, generates greenhouse gas emissions or sometimes greenhouse gas sinks. Um, uh, so whether it's the internet we're currently doing, the Zoom meeting, um, you know, we're actually generating greenhouse gases doing this discussion. Um, not as many as if Leslie and I had flown to Melbourne or Adelaide or somewhere like that, but nevertheless, they're being generated. And so, so a really important part is just being informed about what your own footprint is and, and how you can modify that in really sensible and practical ways. I, I could add a few things to that. Yes, I absolutely agree with Mark on the need to push back on politicians that are sort of saying it's all your fault and you can just buy your solar panels sort of thing. I think one of the most powerful things you can do, well, obviously vote <laughs> for, for, and it's not just what you do, it's how you communicate what you do to those decision makers. So don't just vote for a different party that's doing better on climate. Tell the other ones why you're voting. Tell your bank why you're moving your money or your superannuation company, why you're moving your money to a non-fossil fuel investor. Because if, if those businesses know that they're, they're losing customers for a climate reason, well, then they're much more likely to, to pay attention. I think also one of the most powerful things you can do is not be alone. You know, it's, it's really easy to feel powerless, tiny, frustrated in all of this because it is a huge and wicked global problem. But certainly, you know, over the years when I've been involved in climate action groups and particularly the Climate Council, um, actually becoming involved in a group, supporting a group, um, joining with like-minded individuals, and obviously Vets for Climate Action is a, is a perfect uh, one, um, is not only more powerful action, but I think it just helps you psychologically feel part of the solution instead of part of the problem. So don't feel alone, join, join with others that, that are like-minded and together, uh, you have a very powerful voice. Thanks, Leslie. That's so true. And I'd just comment there that uh, Vets for Climate Action, we're not just vets. We're, we're nurses, we're carers, we're all sorts of people. Um, James, for example, comes from a different background, Ben. So yeah, you don't have to be a vet to join us. We really want anyone who's interested in, in climate change and animals to, to be part of us. And I have to reiterate what Leslie said. It does make you much more empowered and, you've, and there are new channels open up for you to actually have bigger impacts than what you can have on your own. So yeah, if you want to join us, uh, please feel free. You can um, uh, just email us at info at vfca.org.au if, if, if you want to do that. Um, James, do we have any other questions there? Uh, yep, so we've got a more, um, from my a more kind of zoo-specific question, um, because they obviously have a, a huge reach to the general public and children, um, families coming in. Um, is there anything they could do to promote climate action beyond, um, I guess, what we're doing with the vigil and, and some other things. I don't know if Morgan or Leslie or Mark, you'd like to speak on that one? I'll, I'll kick off, I suppose. Look, I think zoos and museums and any of those public facing places that bring families and other people in to, to be entertained um, or to have experiences are a really ideal focal point in our society. To, to deliver a message. Um, and it can be quite a gentle message, but you know, presumably people that come to zoos are interested in animals. So, so for zoos to have exhibitions, you know, where people are going in and out of the entrance or in and out of the gift shop, for example, um, that actually can quite gently deliver the message about concern about climate change and the impacts on, on the species that we love. I think you know they're in absolutely ideal situations to have a send people away with more than just a nice animal experience, but be educated and with a toolkit of actions. Um, I, I think they're in an absolutely box seat to to be able to contribute to to this action. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Uh, Mark or Morgan, do you have any comments there? No, look, I, I think that's that's a, a really good suggestion. I, I, I guess there's also the always the the thing about getting your own house in order, and so uh, so it's actually saying, okay, well, how can that zoo reduce its own greenhouse footprint? So are there things that the, if that zoo or, or whatever other institution can do to um, to re reduce its footprint? And so so you know it may be about heating and cooling, it may be about insulation, it may be about water use or um, foodstuffs um, that animals are eating, and so so that's an important step. And the other one, of course, is if you're into an environment which is increasingly climate challenged, um, is uh, demonstrating and communicating um, about what you're doing to de demonstrating ways of reducing those impacts. So, you know, adequate shade for animals, adequate water for animals, um, changing the way, the layout of your operations to, to ensure that animals can choose the sort of environment, the micro environment that they, they would like to op occupy. And so, so telling people about what you've done and what the alternative was, I think, is part of that conversation. Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much. That's that's fantastic. Uh, before we close off, um, I think Mark and Leslie will stay around for a little while if anyone wants to ask any questions directly. Um, we'd like to get a photo, if we can, of participants. If you're happy to have your photo taken, just turn your camera on. If not, leave it off. That's fine. Um, as I said, the recording of this uh, webinar will be on our on our. Um, our page so you can link to that anytime if you want to see it again or if you have other workers or colleagues who haven't been able to make it today then please feel free to um to direct them to that um ben are you going to do the photo now or yeah if i could there's a bit more yeah, khaki sure. khaki um than we're used to seeing at these <laughs> webinars so khaki, yeah. khaki, I can't, yeah, I can't talk. Right. the uniform yeah. the uniform of the wildlife vet and care uh, yeah. you can smile in three two one Done. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I'd also like just to call on Jeanette Kessels, our chair, just to say a few words before we hang around for a few further questions. Uh, Jeanette, are you free to talk right now? Maybe she's mu muted. I did see her there. There she is. Yeah, yeah there you go. Thanks. Oh. Hello, everybody. I'm very sorry. I'm having a little bit of trouble with, with my Zoom. I had it off. Um, I just wanted to say a very big thank you to you all for coming uh, this afternoon and taking the time. And Professor, particularly Professor Leslie Hughes and, and Professor Mark Howden, they've uh, really been a big part of this conversation with us. Uh, please join Vets for Climate Action. Um, anybody can contribute. Um, I think we're building a powerful force. Um, and uh, yeah, please email us if you have any suggestions or if you'd like to join. Thank you. You're on mute, Liz. Thank you so much. That concludes the webinar. Uh, stick around if you want to ask any questions directly of Mark and Leslie. Otherwise, thanks so much for your time. We really appreciate it. And if you can share those social social media activities that are going on around the vigil in early March, late February, that'd be fantastic. That would, that's one of the biggest ways we think we can reach uh, the general public on, on this issue. So thank you very much.